about two months ago, we uh, had an anniversary we celebrated, and that was the the uh, first anniversary of a Grayson Free Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, also found out uh, that most of the things that I would like to do require a majority vote in the House, 60 votes in the Senate, and a signature by Barack Obama. So you can expect that most of the ideas I have don't become law. Um, but I will say this, I found a couple of things that I could do that didn't require their signature, or didn't require the President's signature, didn't require the Senate or the House to vote. And those I was able to accomplish. The first one was when I got there uh, before I was sworn in in January of 2011, uh, I was oriented <laughs> at an orientation. And there was the first lady that spoke was the payroll chief, and she gave the salaries first thing out of her mouth, first thing I heard when I walked in that meeting was that. And so she left, and I followed her, and I asked her what was the salary in 2008, because we were talking about rolling back spending until 2008, and she told me what it was. So I waited a whole year, and on the 31st of December of this last year, I wrote a check for two, uh, to, to refund all the money except up through 2008 and what that salary, so I refunded the difference. I called the Treasury Department, and they um, had never had anybody call to ask to give a, a check of part of their salary in order to pay down the debt. So they weren't going to let me in. Then they decided they would let me in, but I couldn't bring a staff person, so I was trying to talk another member in to go in because I wanted at least a picture so it was commemorated. <laughs> And finally, they let the staff, another staff person go in with me. They, they took a picture. I gave it to the secretary there, and they told me, don't tell anybody else. I go, I don't think you got a problem. There's not going to be a flood of people coming over here and giving back money. But, and sure enough, there hasn't been. However, I, I thought one, one of the most interesting things I learned was I went to the place that is the Bureau of uh, Public Debt. It's not in the Treasury office, which is right across the street from the White House. It's in a different location. You know where it is? It's in Washington, D.C., and I'll tell you where it is. It's kind of ironic. It's in Chinatown. So all the notes that are sold in order for us to borrow money are sold in Chinatown. And uh, I thought about that, and I thought, what a sad thing. It would almost be funny if it weren't so sad that we borrow so much money from the Chinese, and we're, we do it in Chinatown. Uh, also, Warren Buffett opened his mouth and said, I'll give any Republican, uh, I'll match whatever they give back with their salary. Now that was after I'd already done it, he said that, so I communicated with him, and he said, sure enough you did it, and I'm going to do it. So he's sending in a check next month for the same amount, so we at least get part of Warren Buffett's promised amount of money that he would love to pay in taxes if he only had the chance. <laughs> <laughs> then I also found out one other thing I could do and that was I could uh, hopefully operate my own office and get my own house in order and, and operate it in a way that would be frugal and functional at, like a good Republican. So I did. I didn't really try that hard. I just had, an, I had a motto that we, we could do more with less. I see some of my staff people here, uh, Abigail and Nathan, and they, they helped me. And uh, we, we came up with... Uh, uh, a year in, and there was, we were able to turn back almost a half a million dollars. No one came close to that amount. No one even tried to come close to that amount. But I'll tell you, all it told me was, it was only a picture, that's certainly not a whole lot of money, probably pays down maybe two seconds of the debt. Uh, but what it does say is, there is waste everywhere. You don't have to cut one program. You don't have to cut one service. You don't have to tell one person you can't be on this program. And there may be, need to be some of that. But even if you didn't do that, this was 32% of the amount of money I get. And I know that every bureau, every department, every section of government, every member of the Congress could do it if they only tried. So it's there. And just know in the coming days, I think it's going to get better. Uh, it's going to have to get better. It's going to be because of the work that you're doing. Because we're going to have to win. But you don't have to win the country. That's not your job. I don't either. But I do have to win the people I can influence. Uh, let me tell you 
what the campaign is about. It's summed up in two words. The first word is envy. The president and the Democrats are running a campaign on envy. Uh, you can call it class warfare, but that's not what it is. It's envy. They want to pit groups against each other, and they want to make them envious of each other, of what they have. And they want them to desire that in such a way that will make them, and us, and whoever else is listening, vote for their candidacy. They only think about the next election. They don't think about the next generation. But let me tell you what, what I believe Americans think about, and I, I believe you think about this. Here's the word for you, and that is aspire. I don't think people the general public out there, and you included, envy the other person. You have aspirations. I have aspirations for my children and my grandchildren. I have aspirations for my friends. I have aspirations for myself, and I bet you have aspirations for yourself. You aspire to be something, and whatever that is, you give all you've got to that. It's not like looking and thinking, wow, I don't want to do anything. I just want to get what that person has. That's envy. No. That's not America. That's not the America I know. So the election is going to be based on these two words, aspire or envy. And we're going to see what kind of America we have and what kind of America we stand for and what kind of America we, we believe in. So how do you come into this? Well, if you're an aspiring soul, you've got to get out there and support people support a philosophy based on aspirations of thinking we can do better than we're doing. You know, I've held town hall meetings all across District 8, and I've asked the question to those that come, how many of you believe that the America we're giving our children and our grandchildren is better than the America you have? Maybe one or two out of hundreds of people who have come have said they thought it was better. Usually there's no hands that agree with that statement. They agree that it's not going to be better. But my mom and dad gave me a better America. And their mom and dad gave them a better America. So this, is, this would be the first generation that we would be turning over a country that is in worse shape than the country that was adopted and lived in by, their, by the parents. We can't do that. And so aspire. <laughs> Why? Because. Those aspirations lead to greatness. They lead to inventions. They lead, lead to enterprise. They lead to, to wealth, but, but real riches, true riches, based on, on character and, and, and substance, not, not on some sort of uh, thievery process where we, we take from one and give to another. No. I know you're better than that. I know America's better than that. So we aspire. We aspire to something greater. So for all of you that do, house to house, person to person, starting off with house to house, street to street, city to city, county to county, state to state, that message has to get out. So do you have to help win Alabama or, or North, North Carolina or someplace? No, not really. Just, your, just the people that you know. This group of people here have a great handle on what's happening in politics and what's happening and, and you understand the candidates, and you know why you're for them or against them. There are many, many, many of your friends who do not. They don't know. So they listen to some one-liner on a TV show or a news interview, and that's how they make their decision. Or they look good, or, or some other reason. But they just think, well, I'll just vote for them. So you have a sphere of influence. And what I would tell you is, you take that... Uh, word aspire. Find yourself some candidates that are that match up with that word. Push aside those that believe in envy and you go sell that person to somebody else or some group or your neighbor or someone else in your, at your work. And if every one of us do that, then we're going to win. We're going to win in the fall. But it's not just us. It's the next generation. It's not just winning this next election. That's not what it's all about. Now, I can easily tell you what everybody says. This is the most important election that, that, that we've ever had. And I've heard that statement 
far more than most of the people in this room, many more times. I heard it in 1976 when uh, Gerald Ford ended up losing in a, pretty, uh, in a squeaker to Jimmy Carter. And I heard it again when Ronald Reagan came the next four years later and he was running against Jimmy Carter, the incumbent. And you, and you're gonna, and you hear it, but, but I will tell you for me, even with all of that history, it's still the most important election. But it's not as important as the next generation. It's not as important as the children and grandchildren that are gonna be coming. That's what's important. And you've got to, we've got to keep it in perspective. And so, because those are the people that are going to receive the aspiration we have inside of us. If we aspire for something, in the end, it's going to be primarily for those that come after us, that are our heritage. So my children, grandchildren become, come first. So find yourself some candidates that believe in the word aspire, because that's going to be the king and the key to winning. And we can go out, that's a much easier in my mind, a much easier message to sell. Now, I, I work in a place that's totally dysfunctional. <laughs> I, there, is a, there is a Senate that absolutely just doesn't act unless there is a, a crisis coming. If there's a crisis, we're going to run out of money or, or, or we're, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have a budget or some program is ending because it's, it's sunsetted and we've got to act, then reluctantly they will act. But other than that, there is not one thing that comes there. And then there's a president who has over and over and over again claims he's going to veto certain items. And unfortunately, he never gets the chance because the Senate does his dirty work for him. And I will tell you that this president, who believes in envy, if you're looking for somebody uh, that, that, that owns up to that particular message, it's this president. When, when, when McCain was running uh, and the Orlando Sentinel endorsed uh, Barack Obama, uh, the McCain team called me and asked if I would do the op-ed to that editorial. And I told them I would. And so the Sentinel gave me 600 words, which is uh, a, a significant amount of, of verbiage. And I, I talked about one thing. This, this man, if he becomes president, is indecisive cannot make a decision. And I based it on his history in the Illinois legislature. I'm familiar with the legislature. I was there for, as was said, 28 years. And what I found out in Florida is that we have, I did learn this, we have two buttons, red and green. That's all. <laughs> I also found out in the Illinois legislature there are three buttons, red, green, and yellow. Yellow is chicken. <laughs> and Barack Obama, as a state senator, used that button 123 times. Now, I said at the time, and this probably wasn't the best word to use, I did, or, or phrase to use, but I just said, the decisions he made in, in, in the Illinois legislature that he actually refused to make were rinky-dink issues compared to the weight and measure of the issues he would have to decide as President of the United States. And so I, I made the assertion that he was indecisive. I've been in Washington for a short period of time, but I can tell you, we have a, a president, a leader, that is indecisive. He cannot make a decision. So you wonder, why do, why do we have all these czars? Because those czars are empowered to make the decisions that he cannot or will not make. He can't make them. There are a few, a very few, that filter to him, and he has to make a decision. There was a surge that was done in, in Afghanistan, and he waited three or, two or three months before he could decide, and he split the difference. One said this, one said don't do anything, and so he said, okay, I'll take this position and no. And he finally made a decision. That's one of the few. Don't, don't believe that he made the decision to go after Osama bin Laden. I, I hope you don't believe that. He said it enough that he did, which makes you know, probably did. Now, you don't play golf on the day you're going to take out a song of No, that, that decision was made by Gates and Trace, and, Trace, and, and they, they pushed him out the door and said, go take credit for this. So that's, that's why he has to play on empty. If you 
are indecisive, and you certainly take responsibility for not including the economy or gas prices or anything else, then you have to play with the word envy. On the other hand, whoever our candidate is, I believe our candidate is going to be a, a candidate that embraces the word aspire. And I know that every single person in this room, I believe, embraces that same word. And you want an America where we have a decisive leader who is going to do everything in their power to, to create an America where that word can be revived. And that people can say, yes, I aspire. Not only do I have these aspirations, but I'm certainly confident that they can be carried out because this is America, the greatest nation. And, and, and a leader that says, I'm not going to be indecisive. I'm not going to go out and apologize for America. I'm not going to apologize for the system we have here. I'm going to support it so that those people who live in this country can aspire. And as they aspire, they become successful and we become the light uh, that uh, many presidents have talked about and and we become the beacon of hope for the world, which we are. Because people don't feel, flee this country, they try to get here. Why? Because this is America. It's a great nation. And I'm great and proud to be a part of it. I'm proud to serve you in the United States Congress. I appreciate the opportunity to let me, me come and speak just a little bit about what I see and the importance, your importance, your individual importance in this coming election, it's absolutely imperative that you engage yourself in influencing the people that you know. So thanks for letting me come. Great to see you all. Um, first of all, Congressman, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, second, I'd like to thank you for showing a commitment to public transportation that your former opponent has not shown. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, my question is, it's related to the word aspire. Uh, I appreciate the focus on it, to me that has to do a lot with entrepreneurship. And it seems like the coming coming year is going to have some obstacles for entrepreneurship. For example, uh, if it stays as is, I think the dividend, the tax on dividends, doesn't that go up in January of next year to like 39.5% or something? And are you guys going to have to fight that out? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, yes, we will have to fight it out. <coughs> we will. And it's going to be an interesting fight see what happens. Uh, the federal government doesn't need any more money. It needs to reduce the spending. That's it. Just know that. Please understand, if anybody believes that if the federal government had more money, that money we would spend wisely, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> so, yes, that's going to be a fight. Yes. Um, it, where they are, but have a Valley Victorian. Have a, a Navy SEAL. Have somebody that tells your story and says, Yes, I'm an achiever and I'm a one percenter. I think we need to rebrand what a one percenter is because right now the left has done a good job of saying the rich are fortunate. They are life's lottery winners. That somehow they either get it because they inherited from daddy's money or they stole for it or whatever. But the vast majority is, is um, self-made and I think we need to do a better job of communicating that. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, that's why I believe instead of focusing uh, on the word class warfare, we have to focus on envy, because that's what the word is. And um, unfortunately, uh, that particular issue, uh, just as the president is uh, not a leader, and I've told you that, but he is one of the, uh, he's a fabulous campaigner. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that anything they do is done just helter-skelter, please understand that's not true. That 1%, and the, and the Occupy Wall Street was done for one reason. They believe that Mitt Romney is going to be the candidate. He's a one percent, and he relies on Wall Street. That's why they did it. Why did they shift to the abortion issue? Because they thought maybe Rick Santorum would be the candidate, and so they shifted to there. They just know that everything they do, and you're right, there have, you know, there's going to be an answer. The problem is, for the United States Congress, we don't have the megaphone the president has. He can't continually run against us because there's going to be a candidate. And it may not be tomorrow, but there's going to be a candidate. And once there's a nominee and a candidate, it's going to shift focus, and that candidate is going to be delivering that message. And I think that's going to be a, a much better platform to argue out these things because uh, we have small uh, influences, and we use those but it's hard to get it out. You're not going to, 
you're not going to hear about uh, on a national level too much about what Congress has to say other than maybe from our leaderships every once in a while and that's it. So uh, it is important when we get our nominee, we get behind them. That's where the, the race, you can't run a race against Congress and against our nominee. And I think you're going to see it crystallize what you want is a crystallize. Now, I think it's going to be easier to crystallize it once there's one nominee. Yes. Um, I've talked to a number of the other um, members of your freshman class from Florida, Alan West, Sandy Adams, Dennis Ross, and they're, they're all expressing extreme frustration with Washington being dysfunctional as you have, but also with the Republican leadership in the House and not making as big a cuts as they had hoped when they'd got there and not moving things as fast as possible. Um, is there anything that you really are hoping that the Republican leadership will be, will be doing different this year? Here's what I believe. I believe this month is pretty much it for the Congress and for uh, because the president's going to disappear completely, which he's already disappeared. He's not going to be there. And uh, you're going to see uh, a lot of jockeying for the election, but you're not going to see a whole lot of policy. And that, that's what I believe. Uh, and I'm just giving you the plain truth. However, I want to tell you this. I told the group this today, and this is very, very important. Just know that the 87 freshmen that were sent there are different. And, and I will tell you that no matter who the nominee and the eventual winner is, if it's a Republican, and if we take the, the Senate, that those 87 members will be dictating policy. You can count on that. So is there hope? There is hope. And, the, and, and maybe sometimes we get a little bit short-sighted because we see there's no hope today or tomorrow. But there's hope in the future. And, and I believe no matter who the nominee is, you're going to see that agenda driven by those 87 members that were elected. And you're going to see a much more conservative group of people uh, or a much more group of, of, of issues come forward. You're going to see the repeal of Obamacare. You're going to receive the, uh, uh, see up front, I mean, first off, uh, Dodd-Frank is going to go and, and so forth. And we can go down a list of things, and I, I promise you that's what's going to happen. And those 87 are going to be leading that issue. So there is hope. Right now, it's difficult. It's difficult for the people that are our leaders because there, there is that roadblock in the Senate and, and the president who, who is totally disengaged. So it makes it difficult to pass anything or do anything. Certainly, we would like to have had better cuts, deeper cuts, and I can apologize that we haven't done more. But it's, the problem is um, they just won't budge. And so, but I see a greater day, a better day coming that is going to be a stark contrast, not in 2012 congressional uh, 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 time frame, but after the election, I see an awesome change coming. So just brace yourself. It's going to be good. Yes. Two more questions. Uh, Congressman, this is more of a comment than a question, but uh, two weeks ago we had uh, Congressman Bill Pitts at our Boeing facilities out in the Cape, and he was there for an uh, engineering week celebration. And uh, he had about 20 minutes to do a speech, and he got up, and he spent 15 of those 20 minutes talking about his friend, Congressman Dan Webster. <laughs> <laughs> and his solution to all problems in D.C. is to uh, elect more Republican engineers. So I told him next time I would see you, I would deliver that message. You are now completely electable out of the Cape, because everybody believed that message. So. <laughs> I, you know, he spoke very highly of you and, and the fact that you're an engineer, that, you know, what you did on the state and what you're doing in Congress. So, uh, you know, you've got a great spokesperson over there with uh, Congressman Cooksey. He's a great cheerleader. He is. I will tell you this. When I graduated from college, uh, when I graduated from Georgia Tech, my mom gave me a card. And there was $100 in the card. But on the front of the card it said, four years ago, I couldn't even spell engineer. And then I opened the card up and it says, and now I are one. So <laughs> that's an engineer. Yes. Yeah. Um, are you supporting, I think there has to be a, um, where there's a proposal for a floor vote for E-Verify, to verify the uh, fact that somebody is a U.S. citizen and therefore is eligible legally to hold a job here. Are you in favor of promoting that and having a vote for that? I, be I, I do believe in E-Verify. However, um, I do, uh, I want to make sure it is uh, an, an exact science, number one, and number two, I want to make s certain that it doesn't place all of the burden on an employer. We're trying to create jobs. 
and, and not kill jobs. And the more burdens we place on our employers, which are, are phenomenal, uh, this administration has done, then I think that's the problem. But to me, the biggest problem right now in immigration is not necessarily that. It's, it's the fact that our borders aren't sealed, even though the president thinks they are. So that would be the first thing I think we ought to do, and I, I hope our new administration will do that. Second is, there's a criminal element. That's why Arizona passed the, the state law they did. It wasn't, it, it was the fact that these aren't just regular people coming across looking for some sort of farm job. These are drug runners, murderers, thieves, and so forth that are coming into this country, and they were destroying part of the rural area of Arizona. And, and to me, those are the first ones we ought to round up, the criminal element, and get them out of here, and, and, and then we'll deal with the rest. So anyway, that's, that's sort of my whole, I didn't ask about all my whole feelings about immigration, but that's it. Um, I will tell you this one thing. It's something I said today at a, another Republican meeting, and, and that was this. Just know that principle and, and power cannot coexist. And, and so if there were, so there's, there's this envy versus uh, the word aspire, envy or aspire, and there's also principle versus power. If people are consumed with power and the election, the next election, uh, then it pushes principle not off to the side, out of, totally out of the way. They cannot coexist. On the other hand, if we make decisions based on principle, then power is pushed aside, and it's, it becomes not just, in, uh, not just uh, smaller, but totally insignificant. And, and to me, if we're going to have, no matter what legislative body, whether, whether it's the, the legislature in Idaho or, or Florida or Maine or, or the United States Congress, if we really want to change the culture, the culture, which is what, if there was anything uh, I could tell you would be a one-sentence goal of my own, and that is changing the culture of Washington, D.C. Because the only way we'll do that is to allow principle to push power completely out of the way. And when that takes place, you're going to see a new Washington. And I have hopes that will happen. So anyway, thanks for letting me come.